Ladies and gentlemen, a please warm welcome for Catherine Beerbalsin, headmistress of Michaela School Community. Hello. Right, you know, I said, oh, I don't want to get too close. I said to this guy at the back, I really want to impress this audience. So can you tell me how to say hello in Dutch? And he said, hello. <laughs> and I thought, all right, well, that won't do. So watch this. Huda <laughs> Yeah, pretty good, eh? And I got an applause. And you know why? Because learning is hard. Right? It's really hard. And I want to ask you today why you wake up in the morning. Is it to do your job? How about being a rich banker instead? Is there anybody in the building who would prefer to be a rich banker? I don't see any hands. And you know, I'm guessing that that's because everyone who's in education wants to change the world. Okay? That's why we all went into education because we want to change the world. But here's the catch. We can't change the world by doing what's always been done. If you do what you've always done, you get what you've always got. So what then has always been done in education? Well, in everything, really. People copy those around them. It's what 99% of the world does. What they've always done and what they'll always do. They copy the norm of their age and they never question the received wisdom. In schools, we face problems, right? We all know this. We face loads of problems. We have teacher shortages, kids with challenging backgrounds, kids who struggle in the classroom academically, unsupportive parents, they're a real problem, unsupportive media, society, the list is really long. And then we do what everyone does. We use progressive teaching methods, progressive behavior systems, and we set progressive expectations, which are really low, for our children. We cross our fingers and we hope for the best. Well, my advice is, just like him, be different, okay? That's my number one piece of advice is, be different. In 2011, uh, I first came up with the idea of setting up Michaela, the school. And, um, after a long battle I won't bore you with, we finally opened in 2014, in September 2014. We now have 600 pupils, and this academic year in August, so, you know, in a few months, we'll get our first GCSE results, so those are national exams. And I think our children will likely do well, but that's not the most incredible thing about Michaela. What visitors are most impressed with is the environment of the school, how kind and hardworking and motivated our pupils are, despite coming from London's poorest communities. We're in the inner city, so gangs, knives, they're part of our daily experience. Simply keeping our children safe from the underworld of the inner city is a challenge, but we succeed. And today I want to share with you some of the things that we've learned about what works in schools. So, number one, learning is always our focus, okay, always. Learning is hard, like I said. Happiness is a byproduct of learning, okay? It, 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 people often say we need to ha happiness lessons and that, that is wrong. If you teach kids well and they learn, they will be happy because they go to school to learn. That's the number one thing that we need to remember. And learning should always be our focus as a teacher and as a leader in school. Number two on there is Rousseau is wrong. Okay, we just need to remember this. Rousseau believed that there's something in the child that you want to draw out. That's just wrong. Okay? We need to put things into the child. Okay, so that, 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 that basic thing there, you're not drawing it out you are putting it in, okay? Number two, one of the, the three, sorry. Uh, centralized detentions. Now, most schools have detentions. Certainly, if you have a challenging intake, you must have uh, behavior systems that, that will work. And one way that takes the pressure off teachers is to make your detentions centralized. So they're run on a rota by the teachers and they're, they're supported centrally. You're not just leaving it up to the individual teacher. 
One of the big things that we do at Michaela that I think is different is the consistency that we get across the school. And that comes from the senior leadership team that is trying to get teachers to be more consistent than you would find at other schools. So one way is through centralized attentions. Another is through consistent behavior systems. So at Michaela, now you could do it differently, but you want to do it similarly across the school. We have merits and demerits, okay? That's what we use. And if you get two demerits, you get a detention. We try and aim to give out, and I, I'll say later on, about four or five merits. Uh, you know, every teacher should be thinking for their ratio should be four or five merits to every one demerit that they're giving out. And this is a general consistent theme across all of the teachers. And all the children understand the behavior system. So it's easy. Children like routine. They like to know what's expected of them. So you want to have that. If you give too much freedom and autonomy to your teachers, then the con it, it makes kids confused. And, and they, they don't know what to expect when they go to the classroom. So four on there, centralized homework. Um, again, I mean, you will all know in schools, the, the children do their homework for Mr. X, they don't do their homework for Miss Y, because there is too much autonomy and freedom given to the teachers and to the systems in the school. If you centralize the homework so that everybody has a set day, so that the, the senior leaders are very clear about what is being set and so on, and that there is order to it, real order and structure to that homework, all of your children will complete all of their homework all of the time. And that should be your goal, that 100% of children are completing their homework 100% of the time. And that, that really should be the goal, because the kids who end up not doing the homework are always the poorest kids, are always with, uh, the kids who don't have the support at home. And they are the ones that we most need to help. Um, senior leadership team, that's the SLT there, so meetings every morning. We meet every morning and we go through detail. We're obsessed with detail. I know all the different things that are going on in the school. I want to know, you know, I'm talking about the clocks being exact. I'm looking when the bins are going out. I want to know how the gate works. Do we have a bin there so the kids can put their rubbish in? What about phone collection? Also, I know all of those details and I'm obsessed with them. And when I say you're not that important, what I mean by that is heads often think well, you know, do you know who I am? I need to be at events like this more often, etc. And I rarely go to events like these uh, because I'm in my school every day and I'm obsessed with the detail. And that's really, get your hands dirty is what I'd say as a head. Um, number six, consistent sharing of good practice with teachers. So amongst our teachers, they are going around doing observations of each other constantly. And when I say observation, it makes it sound too official because it really isn't an observation. They drop in. They drop in for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. They sit and they watch. They might say, oh, you know, why don't you try this next time or try that? I'm going to take this idea from you. Thanks very much, right? They're doing this all the time. And when I say all the time, um, oh, I don't know, 20 to 30 uh, observations will happen in a day, easily. And there are only 40 teachers in my school. They're constantly in and out of each other's lessons because they love sharing that good practice. Ban bureaucracy. Now, this is key, really key. In schools, people spend far too much time on bureaucratic nonsense. If I hold a meeting, I never take minutes. I never write out an agenda, never happens. Uh, my meetings every morning with my senior team, during the day I have a notebook where I'm writing down things that I need to talk to them about and then the next day I run through my notebook because I've written it down for me to remember, but I'm not typing it up and putting it into an agenda and sending it out to them because it's a waste of my time. <laughs> I, I don't do things that are a waste of time. Uh, people are always writing, senior leaders are always writing long reports and writing um, long uh, self-evaluation plans and uh, plans for the next three years. We don't do any of that. It doesn't happen because it's a waste of time. If you're having to spend all your time writing reports, something's going wrong. You know, once a man visited the school and he said to me, yes, but Catherine, if it isn't being written down, it isn't being done. And I said, quite the opposite. If you're too busy writing it down, then you're not doing it, right? So it's really important to remember that. If you're spending too much time writing stuff, you're not doing it. Next point, um, personalized dif personalization and differentiation. I mean, my colleagues mentioned this. You know, I almost want to say scrap the lot. I mean, 
that's an exaggeration. Um, but you, the, the bottom line there is to remember that children will make similar kinds of mistakes. Feeding back from the front of the class about those similar kinds of mistakes is fine. The fad, the fad and the trend nowadays around personalize it, differentiate it, is, is exaggerated. And while you might have a little bit of that, and certainly as they get older beyond 15, 16, I can see the need for more personalization. But lower down, really, children are learning and making the same mistakes, <laughs> and you, you, you don't want to waste your time with those fads trying to make it all personal, because you, you, you want to treat them as a whole. And, um, and feedback, I would say, from the front. You will differentiate to a certain extent, but I would say keep that to a minimum. Uh, tech, I want to mention briefly, I think is a real red herring in education. We do not have iPads. We do have computer rooms, but they go there to do their maths homework. Uh, we, do, uh, we use a particular website where they do their maths on there. And we have banned all other websites. They cannot get on the other websites. So, you know, it's fixed. The computer is fixed so that they cannot get on those other websites. Um, all this business of, of, of tech exploration, I think, personally, is a waste of time in schools. And it takes away from real learning. Um, I said dance like no one is watching. Now, this is really important. That's a nice rule for life, you know? In life, you wanna dance. When you go dancing at the next wedding you go to, dance like no one is watching. And I feel like our school is dancing all the time as if no one is watching, because I don't care what anyone thinks of us, right? That, that is key, right? Do not care what other people think of you, right? <laughs> because if you're constantly trying to please everybody all the time, you will please no one and you will get nowhere. You have to know what your vision is and then you need to figure out what you need to do to get there. I don't care what people think about me. I think it's a key, key skill that you need to have in leadership. You have to not care what people think about you and you have to dance as if no one is watching. And then the last point, right, whoa! <laughs> and the last point is being brave. And to be able to dance like no one is watching, you have to be brave, don't you? And to be a real leader who makes real difference, you have to be brave. You need to do things that nobody else thought was possible, that other people tell you is impossible. You need to just push the boat out and go for it because you know your kids. I don't know your kids. I don't know your schools, right? You know what your kids need. And so often we feel burdened by what government is telling us to do, what the inspectorate is telling us to do, what colleagues elsewhere are telling. You know what you need to do, right? So take it on board and then just go for it. Get your staff on board with you and go for it because you want to be able to be Edie Hirsch's age and look back at your life and think, what did I achieve? What did I do, right? And you wanna be able to feel proud of that. And if you haven't been brave, you won't feel as proud as hopefully, I hope everyone in this room will. So, now we'll come down to lessons, putting knowledge in and questioning. So, you need to put the knowledge into them, okay? Your teachers need to put the knowledge into the kids. Number one thing I'd say is, are you cold calling a variety of pupils? The underachieving pupils, do you only pick the pupils in the class who you know know the answer? Or are you picking a variety of pupils? Are you picking the pupil who you know never has his hand up? Do some questions, some of your questions, target the very next step in the learning. Now, my colleagues again talked about this, building blocks. You are building learning bit by bit. So when you're questioning, you need to make sure that your questions are questioning the very next step and the very next step to see have they got it. What I always say about teaching is that you are driving the bus, okay? There's a bus and you are driving it. Unfortunately, with progressive teaching methods these days, they let the kids drive the bus. Kids can't drive, right? They can't drive, they're too young. They cannot drive, you can drive. You have degrees, you have been doing this for years, you drive the bus and the kids get on the bus with you. When you're in the lesson, the key thing there is to check, are all the kids in the bus? Because you don't want to drive off and leave two of them behind, right? So you need to make sure all of them are in there. Where number three is, are you asking to reveal misunderstanding? 
okay? Because you need to make sure all the kids are on that bus with you and they are all moving ahead. Explanations. So, when you're explaining the thing, does it build up from the very simple, all those small building blocks, to the complex, right? You start just explaining a really complex question. I started learning Dutch today. I learned one word, right? Tomorrow, maybe I'll learn a second word. You go slowly, little by little, and your explanations need to break it down. Is the one point that you want them to learn, and are you clear in your head? Do you know what that point is? Are you coming back to it constantly, right? Constantly through the lesson, because kids forget. They're kids. They don't know how to drive. They need you driving and you constantly coming back saying, okay, you get in, you get in. Oh, you jumped out again, let me put you back in. Oh, you come out, let me put you back in. And you're constantly checking to make sure that they're on the bus. Now, throughout the lesson, they will remember what they practice, okay? You need, this, this is key. They will remember what they practice. So if in the lesson you are practicing X, they're not going to remember Y. It's really important that you practice the thing that you want them to have learned by the end of the lesson, right? Too often, teachers don't do this because they get distracted. Sometimes they get distracted by this game that I say called, uh, guess what's in my head? And they say things like, so how do we say good afternoon in Dutch to a bunch of my colleagues? And my colleagues would all sit there and look at you. Like sometimes it happens in the classroom. The kids all look at you and go, what? because you're asking them to guess what's in your head. What you want to do is ask them something that you've taught them, right? If you've taught them it, then they have a fighting chance. If you haven't taught them the thing that you want them to know and you're just asking them because you believe that Rousseau was right and you believe that you're bringing it out of the child, little Amy at the front who puts her hands up all the time and is able to answer the question She's able to answer it because somebody taught her at home. Somebody else put that information in there, right? You didn't do it, somebody else did. But little Johnny at the back of the class looks at Amy and thinks, you're really clever and I'm really stupid. What Johnny doesn't do is think, well, actually, it's because of my socioeconomic background and my parents don't have books at home, so that's why I wasn't taught that at home. He doesn't think that. He just thinks he's dumb. And ultimately, it's the teacher who is responsible for making Johnny feel like he's dumb because the teacher has played the game, guess what's in my head, instead of teaching something first before asking questions on it. Are you signposting? So. Are you clear on what they want them to learn? Number two, are you sure that what you're saying is helping them learn it, right? That's key. Sometimes teachers going off on some crazy tangent over here. Is what you're saying about what you want them to learn? Is learning your focus? Because learning is really, really hard. And are you assessing that they've learned it? Is everybody on the bus, okay? Now, ethos. I'm going through a lot of stuff here, aren't I? So, ethos, personal responsibility. This is key in our school, key. Often, teachers are made to feel like it's all about them, okay? And I, I say this to the leaders in the room. Uh, what are your scores? How are your kids doing? And it's good to ask the teachers that because you do want to hold your teachers to account. But too often, the balance goes towards the teachers being held to account and the students are never held to account. The students need to understand personal responsibility and it needs to be narrated in the school all of the time, okay? So that the kids understand, well, it's, I'm responsible for my grades, I'm responsible for my homework, and if I haven't done it, then I will get a detention. And that we are consistent with our centralized detention systems so that child knows that he can never get away with not doing his homework. Number two, we have an expression called, even when it's difficult, especially when it's difficult. And the idea there is you do the right thing, even when it's difficult, especially when it's difficult. Because it's hard to do the right thing, especially when it is difficult. And that is when it is most important that you make sure you do the right thing. You are stoical. You don't sit there. So I tell you what we do. When they arrive first in year seven, and they've just come from different primary schools, and we need to get them used to the Michaela way, we, te we have a boot camp. We call it boot camp, behavior boot camp. And um, 
we get them to do a whole lot of stuff for that week on our ethos and why we are the way we are. And we, we do a whole session on Nelson Mandela. And we say, you know what? Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison. You have a 20 minute detention, you can get over it, right? <laughs> the fact is, detention is no big deal. And they need to get that. You know, children can get irate, angry, screaming, I'm telling my mom, rah, rah, rah. They got a 20 minute detention. They're gonna do a bit of work, whoop de do. And this needs to be narrated around the school. Um, top of the pyramid. Uh, we have a whole expression of getting towards the top of the pyramid. And at the bottom of the pyramid, you, you do things, you do the right thing, because you might get a detention or a demerit. And that's really at the bottom. And it's good if they get onto the pyramid, because some children don't even want to do the right thing ever, right? <laughs> so you get on the pyramid, okay, I don't want to get a detention, I'm going to do it. Then the next step up is, uh, I'll do it because I want to get a merit, right? And then the next step up there is, well, I want to impress somebody. I want to impress my teachers, I want to impress my parents. Next step up is, I understand that my future is tied to the way in which I behave now. And if I learn how to behave properly, I'm gonna have a great future. And right at the top of the pyramid, we say, it's just who we are. And what we're all planning to do, what we do at schools is, we're trying to move the children from the bottom of the pyramid to finally getting to the top of the pyramid for everything. So I can tell you with certainty, that 100% of my children have now moved from being at the bottom of the pyramid to the top for bringing in a pen. Everybody at my school will bring in a pen because that's just who they are. They weren't like that at the beginning, they are all there now. Do they all make 100% effort on their homework? No. Some of them are at the top, some of them are somewhere in the middle, some are still at the bottom. But our role as, as teachers is to try and push them up that pyramid uh, in everything. That, that's what we're doing, we're teaching them. So, uh, being grateful for your hard work. Now this is key, key, all right? It's like the personal responsibility point. Teachers are killing themselves all over the world. They're doing all this marking, they're doing all this planning, they're doing all this meeting with parents, they're killing themselves, and the kids just, well, they expect it. Kids will expect it unless you narrate it otherwise. They are children and gratitude needs to be taught, okay? When you have a toddler, three-year-old, you have a bit of chocolate, you say to him, what do we say? Thank you, and then the toddler says, thank you, mommy, and you give him the chocolate. If he doesn't say thank you, you don't give him the chocolate. We understand that with young children we must teach gratitude. It is the same with older children, and you must teach them to be grateful for your hard work, because you're working hard for them. They need to know that, and they need to appreciate you. Um, next point, mistakes are okay. It's okay to make mistakes in this classroom. It's okay to make mistakes with our ethos. We're on your side. We're with you. We're fighting with you because we're fighting the big guys out there who aren't gonna give you that job interview, who aren't gonna give you that place at the top university. We're in this together. We're climbing the pyramid together. We're in the same bus and you're coming with me, right? Mistakes are fine. And the last point, we say this, this is one of our mottos, work hard, be kind two things you want your children to be. You want them to work hard. We never talk about children being bright or not so bright and so on at Michaela. We talk about working hard. He's not doing well, he's not working hard enough. Oh, he failed that test, he didn't work hard enough. Always. It's always about how hard you work. Second point is, it's not, right, it's not good enough to just work hard. You need to be kind. You need to be a good person. And if you can get your kids doing those two things, You've won, that's what you want. You want them to work hard and to be kind. So, next point, in terms of building relationships, you wanna build relationships with the kids. So there's lots of ways of doing this. I mean, here's a few points in doing it. Entrances and exits, when they're coming in and out of your classrooms, you say to one child, really great work today, fantastic. Or when they're coming in, naughty Johnny is coming in and you know he's a bit naughty and you say to him, expecting great things from you today, don't let me down. Nice little whispers like that, quick. 
merits to the quiet pu quieter pupils, number two there. So I said ratio of four to five merits to one. You're handing out lots of merits. There they're going, miss, 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 look at me. Children want to please. Children want the praise, but they don't want praise for nothing. You need to make sure that the praise is for something good, because when you're just praising everything, it becomes meaningless. You want to narrate the demerits and then rebuild the relationship. So you give a demerit, you give a detention, but you explain why. I've given that demerit because you weren't sitting properly on your chair. And then if he ends up with the detention, after the detention, you will, after the detention, you will go and talk to him and say, expecting great things from you next time. So you've rebuilt that relationship. You're friendly and upbeat all the time. You're winking, you're smiling, you have in-jokes with your class, nicknames, have a nice evening, all that sort of stuff builds a relationship. And then we have these good postcards home. This is a very simple thing that everyone can do in their schools. You have these good postcards and the teacher just fills it out quickly. You just have their form class and their name and then had a wonderful day in the test today or had a, gave great contribution in class today and you can give it to the child or you can actually post it home. So now I want to show you some examples, I mean, you can read this now, of the kind of thing that happens in our schools, in our school. It, people think that teaching, having knowledge as the focus of your lessons means that children cannot be creative. I have so many examples of how knowledge is the thing that enables creativity. And you can see that here where these children are talking about the, the planets and they're talking about me, the music and they, they are able to understand the music because of the knowledge that they have been taught around the planets and also around the, the gods. And they've done that in English, but they understand their music through that. Uh, here is another example of music and history, okay? They had been taught, uh, they've been taught about the Second World War. They've, they, 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 they know their music really well. They, and when I say taught about the Second World War, they've been given that knowledge. They haven't been told to bring that knowledge out of them. And here, they are children, these are children at the school having a conversation which is filled with knowledge and enables them to be independently minded. It enables them to be creative. It's knowledge that leads to those things. I next want to be able to show you some of the artwork that our children have done. And again, this is just direct instruction where we are teaching from the front and teaching them how to draw. Now, uh, to say on that, at, when they arrive with us at 11, remember these are inner city kids. They have never drawn anything in their lives. They don't know anything about art. This is a variety of art that we've got from our, 11, from our 14 to 15 year olds that they have done, right? And this, this is what they do. This is standard art at, at Michaela. Um, that boy really does look exactly like that. <laughs> That's his self-portrait. Um, and. Uh, you can see it automatically in the artwork. In, and these are inner city children who have never drawn before. And after three years of art, this is what they can draw, right? It's amazing what they can do. Um, and you see it just there. It, I, I would show you their English essays, but you know, it would take a lot longer to read. This, th this girl, for instance, I mean, she is, 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 is um, special needs. She struggles, really, really struggles. I mean, she looks exactly like that. It's, I can't believe that they can do this sort of stuff. Um, and that this is their artwork. So, um, I am, um, yeah, it's, it, it is, I'm, I'm just always amazed. I'm always amazed by what they're able to do. And um, I want to speak to those of you who are uh, school leaders here. You know, as school leaders, we must lead. Okay, it's, it, it, it's, it's us who must leave. We have to have the vision and we have to make the final decisions and we have to carry the weight of responsibility and accountability for the school. Often your staff may give you an idea. The views of your staff will give you an understanding of what the school looks like from the ground and that's invaluable, okay? And it should be treated with the reverence it deserves. But in the end, we are the ones who decide whether the idea is good or bad, whether it fits with the vision and whether it makes the school weaker or stronger. Remember that it's our moral duty, okay? We have to be brave. And as educators, we have to do what is right for all children. They all have to be on the bus, not just the children who can fend for themselves. We have to do what is right, especially, right? Especially when it's difficult for those children who depend on us for a fighting chance in life, okay? For many of them, 
We are all that they have, okay? It really is, for many of them, we're all that they have. Some kids have a bum deal and don't get read to when they're younger. Were they born struggling to learn this stuff? I don't know. You know, were they born just not very clever? I don't care whether IQ is a thing or not, because I know with certainty that environment has at least some impact. Is it 20%, 50%, 70%? Who cares? All that should matter to us is how to influence that environment as much as we can to help our children change their stars. And that's what we want to do. We want them to change their stars. It's our duty to teach them knowledge so that they can understand it and manipulate it. We must teach excellent behavior so that it becomes a habit and second nature to them. Only then will they be able to do what they want with their lives. Remember that it's only thanks to their knowledge-filled and traditional educations that revolutionaries like African-American Black Panther Stokely Carmichael existed. Stokely Carmichael coined the term Black Power and was educated at the very traditional Bronx Science High School. It created eight Nobel Prize winners, but it also created Stokely Carmichael. And then there is Nelson Mandela with his very traditional education, or Alice Walker, the African-American writer who has revolution running through her veins and her books. We need to teach our children well and fill their minds with tons of knowledge so that they can become the revolutionary, the inventor, or the creator, because knowledge is a prerequisite to all three. So you need to be brave and dare to use the freedom that you have to do things differently. Paradox is the name of the game. Autonomy is found through authority, creativity through imitation, and skills through content. Self-control is what sets us free. You need to dare to think out of the box and do what we said at the beginning, which is change the world. I want to show you now a video of our school. Um, so where is it? Here. There we go. So I whispered underneath my breath Heard it, darling, you look perfect tonight Well, I found a woman Stronger than anyone I know She shares my dreams, I hope that someday I'll share her home Carry more than just my secrets To carry love, to carry children of our own
just one brief thing to say, which is that my colleagues and I have shown you the stats, we've given you the evidence, we've explained why and how we must change the world. It's now up to you to go ahead and change it. Thank you.